I come at this uh, situation from, uh, like many of the former, the previous panelists on the other panels, uh, from a very uh, public health, public policy point of view. However, um, I want to make uh, just a couple of points about that, but I also want to uh, spend a, a minute or so talking about the potential for the public-private partnerships, the, the investments. What is, the, what is this about? What are the possibilities? Uh, I'm going to try to keep this to about five minutes just to give some introductory flavor, and then uh, the other panels will join in, and uh, hopefully uh, you all will participate as well. So first of all, I, we look at this uh, from the, I run the National Center for Disaster Preparedness. So uh, from our point of view, this is uh, another in a long series of massive uh, public health catastrophic events that we characterize as, uh, as uh, large-scale disasters. Um, but the category of large-scale disasters includes everything from, uh, from the terrorism we saw on 9-11 to Katrina and Sandy and uh, the accident in Fukushima and the tsunami associated with it, et cetera. But in the context of a biological threat uh, from nature or from uh, other sources, including terrorism, um, I think we have uh, understood these very large-scale events to be above and beyond as a first sort of characteristic of what we mean by this, and we call them mega-disasters, is a situation that overwhelms the potential of local resources to solve the problem, to deal with the response, to save lives, uh, to, in the case of other kinds of disasters, to recover from the disaster, and so on. And I think uh, this Ebola outbreak uh, fits, obviously, uh, virtually all of the key characteristics that we're going to see here, uh, including when this eventually ends, the so-called recovery from the Ebola crisis in West Africa is going to take a very, very long time because we're dealing with countries that are uh, immersed in serious socioeconomic deprivations and poverty and uh, really a serious lack of a healthcare infrastructure that's up to the task of uh, in many cases of dealing with day-to-day -day public health needs, and then when a crisis happens, and as uh, was said in the previous panel, people are dying and lost, it just further weakens the healthcare structure. So the recovery here is going to be also a very long-term need, much like Haiti post the earthquake there a few years ago. And, and I, I mention this now because if we don't start thinking about recovery and what that means at the beginning of the process, that means that we'll leave there and the cameras will go away and the coverage will stop and we'll still be in the same situation of high vulnerability that we're in uh, before. Second point related to that is that this is clearly a, a global problem with global consequences and therefore global responsibilities or international responsibilities to deal with this. And uh, as there have been multiple outbreaks of Ebola, uh, usually easily contained and, uh, and other diseases like Ebola, by the way, um, it has not reached a, in an international stage like Ebola is. A, because the, uh, the uh, occurrence is so extraordinarily uh, high in uh, West Africa and because we've had these uh, creeping uh, episodes of Ebola that have appeared in Spain and uh, in the U.S. and so forth. So, it already has the notion uh, of uh, people understand that this is a much bigger Ebola crisis than we've had before, and it is also affecting beyond West Africa. The second point about uh, this is that uh, the, uh, the key to solving this problem, like virtually every other biological type of threat that we might face, is to be as upstream as possible. So the focus on the downstream consequences of how do we care for individual people that arrive in a U.S. hospital, let's say, or even uh, treating people who are affected by Ebola in the countries that are principally affected in West Africa is not enough. We have to get higher up uh, in the uh, realities of why we have these issues and what are we going to do to prevent them in, in the long term. In other words, treating the downstream consequences is going to be uh, ultimately and virtually always is uh, insufficient to bring a rapid and efficient end to a threat uh, such as this. Um, and key to that point of getting upstream is really science and the investments that are needed in several different areas that I think are absolutely critical uh, for Ebola and many other uh, illnesses or conditions like that. And those 
those scientific advances that we desperately need right now are in several areas, one of them being in early detection. We have to get much better at virtually instantaneous recognition of what we're dealing with in a very specific way. I mean, it's, you know, in 2014, for us not to be able to do a, you know, a one droplet blood test and know that we have Ebola like right now, um, I'm, I'm a little disappointed in my uh, humankind here. I think we, we can and should be doing better. Now, this is very, very difficult because of the structure of the Ebola virus, because of detec detection, early detection technologies, because of low viral loads in the beginning. I'm not saying it's not hard, it's just something that we need to be investing in for this and other diseases. The second area where we need uh, science is on the prevention side, and I'm talking about here um, either dealing with the underlying conditions that produce uh, a recurrent virus like Ebola that is so deadly and often self-contained, but this time not, uh, is, uh, to, is to make sure that we have the vaccines that are necessary, that are developed and produced at a rate that's able to make sure that people are safe. And that, that is really a critical issue here. We, it's going to take a long time to build a, a true, robust uh, health and public health system in places uh, like Liberia and Guinea and so forth, but in the mean and Sierra Leone. But in the meantime, uh, we really need this vaccine, and we need it fast. And not only that, we need techniques that will allow us to develop uh, vaccines very rapidly. It's not just developing them, but producing them in sufficient quantities and having a system to distribute them and administer them. All of that has to be part of the essential work of the science-based strategies here. And the third piece uh, has to do with the countermeasure development, the, the uh, antibacterials, the antimicrobials uh, that are needed to treat people very definitively. We're dealing with a very, very primitive uh, health and public health response. We're treating people more or less like we did 100 years ago. I guess we have better PPE right now. But, but basically, we're using the most profoundly old-fashioned tools to deal with this, uh, you know, current day threat, and it's just, uh, you know, we kind of need to get beyond that, and we need to have, be able to have the investments made in those three areas: detection, prevention, and countermeasures, uh, to really, to really make progress. And that progress that we make on Ebola uh, should never be thought, in my mind, to be only for Ebola. We have to be thinking and investing uh, in ways that make sure that we have these capacities built into the system for now and uh, for the long term. So the final point, I, I just want to make uh, a point or two uh, with, uh, about issues uh, having to do with uh, the private sector and investments in this and what's in it for uh, people with capital or people with a vested corporate interest in developing, let's say, a vaccine. Uh, how does this end up being uh, you know, a win-win-win for everybody? And right now, it's a little hard to see how that gets manifest with respect to the Ebola crisis. I'm going to say this with, admittedly, a very a kind of uh, elementary school level knowledge of um, what social impact bonds are supposed to do and how they work and all that. I just don't see, see how this, and hopefully our other panels will shed light on this, but my understanding is that if you're, if you're going to make an investment, let's say, in something that would save Medicaid in the U.S. X amount of dollars over a decade, then an investor says, okay, we're going to fund the interventions that will improve the quality and the outcomes from whatever we're doing, well, let's say with the Medicaid population. But in return, we want to see our investment rewarded with some even low-level interest so that we've said we've, we've made a difference socially and we're returning to our, from, our, from our investments, we're returning some level of gain on that money invested. There you have a payor with a specific interest in keeping the costs down. That would be Medicaid or Medicare, let's say. I'm not sure who the payor is in the case of Ebola. Like, who, who's going to say we've saved money because you invested $100 million? Uh, how do you measure that? Who, who actually produces the return on that investment? And I'm not, you know, again, it's, this is total naivete. Uh, and uh, I'm be interested to hear what other people have to say about that. But I, I don't know uh, how that works in a situation like Ebola. We just need money here. We need money to stimulate uh, maybe the uh, development of vaccines. Obviously, we do. We have government agencies that are BARDA and, uh, and its BioShield program, for example, that are dedicated to try to find ways to make the investments to accelerate the process of developing detection vaccines and countermeasures. Uh, but. Um, 
uh, other than the direct uh, charitable contributions, which I think we should be seeing a whole lot more of. You know, we, we've had very little of the money committed. The 1.4 billion is actually materializing. Very little money coming from just individuals. Uh, and I don't think the international community is as yet responding as charitably as we did even with, uh, let's say, in Haiti, which was a much, much more robust uh, investment in, in helping people. So uh, hopefully the panel will help explore some of the ways that uh, this, these other kinds of strategies, social investment, social impact, et cetera, will manifest themselves. So uh, I'm looking forward to hearing as much as I can about that. So. Thank you, Dr. Adlin. Um, I'm, Win I'm Wendy Diller, by the way, and I'm not less but blunt letter who is delayed. So, um, and I helped organize the panel. Um, I do. Ha I know you have to leave. I do have a question for sure. you, um, and that is: Is there any? There are some government initiatives to help um, encourage private in private industry to undertake some of the develop the development of testing, testing, and right. vaccines. Are there any particular initiatives that you think work what should, that the government should be doing, or that work what particularly that are work that will work well or could work well? Um, well, let's take the issue of vaccine development generally. Um, so the government, uh, through BARDA and through BioShield, I guess, is um, is to my understanding, it says, it, you we understand that you're a pharma. Uh, company, this is what you do for a living, but it costs you, you say, let's say a billion dollars to develop a new drug or vaccine. Uh, I'm not sure if that's entirely accurate, but it's somewhere in that vicinity, at least that's so claimed by the pharma industry. Um, and they say, well, we don't really want to, I don't really want to do that because I, I have a, I have a, for a, for a disease that's actually quite rare and uh, will not be an ongoing, there won't be an ongoing market for it. So they'd rather work on something, some other kind, you know, a measles vaccine or something else that's much more prevalent where they could see a profit at the end of the tunnel here. But for these more unusual outbreaks like this, uh, the financial incentive for a company uh, to, to invest in the R&D necessary to produce that, uh, that vaccine in particular, for example, is not really all that clear. So the government's idea is that we'll help support the R&D. You develop this, so uh, you know, or we'll guarantee the, the purchase of it. But something um, along these lines has to be understood in order for the the big pharma to, to divert from its big time profit making needs and uh, its ability and willingness to develop vaccines. Let's say for more unusual situations. Right. Thank you. Um, do the panelists have any questions for Dr. Led Redliner? What well, why don't we do retorts would be okay also. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, why don't why don't we do this while while we're waiting for less also we have uh, we have three other distinguished panelists. Why don't we go right. through them one by one? Um, I'd ask you to introduce yourself briefly since uh, since Les is uh, not here at the moment. And uh, your your areas of expertise actually dovetail into many of the comments that Dr. Redliner had made, perhaps you can expound upon that uh, in relation to your experience with your work. So let's go with Christopher Ream, if you could uh, introduce yourself quickly, please. Sure, and uh, thank you for having me today, and, and thank you for your comments. Um, I may have a few retorts or thoughts on how social impact Good. bonds, or more accurately today, pay for success may be relevant here. Um, my background is not specifically in healthcare, however it is in understanding how we engage the private sector to invest largely into areas of public interest, public outcomes. So I am a managing director at the Community Development Venture Capital Alliance, which is an association of many different, mostly for-profit venture funds, but all of which hold some type of social mission in mind. Many of those are, are mostly community uh, investment uh, minded, uh, jobs related, but the questions we deal with in, in these funds as well as the fund of funds that we manage relate to questions of understanding how do we engage the private sector into areas where it's not obvious who is a payor, that there's an obvious market solution for problems. Healthcare is, is such a natural one, it's amazing to me that there isn't more already established. Um, I'll keep my comments really brief, but, but almost to follow just from what you said, in an environment where there is not necessarily an obvious payor, in the case of who's taking care of Ebola, it's hard to understand how investment is going to be attracted to, just as you said, 
finding innovation in vaccines. But we should think about investment at two grades, and these are almost time-delimited grades. One is infrastructure. We heard in the last panel just how little infrastructure there really is in some of these countries uh, that would provide the baseline support for any kind of disaster or disease response. So we can talk about investments role over that position, separate from more of what our funds are doing, which is investment in innovation. How are we, in fact, moving ahead on research and development on those areas that aren't immediately obvious to the private sector? Well, we already have a large public sector response to research and development, which is, which is brilliant and can always be expanded, but the commercialization of that is always the question. And so uh, I would just suggest that let's talk about social impact bonds or pay for success as one model. Uh, another would be a wholly private model in which there are teams of people ready to go and there is a public sector payor when, when needed. If that were immediately obvious, it probably would be done already. But in the idea of pay for success, there are really three participants that, that need to come to play. There is a public outcome that has to be addressed for which there's some public sector participant already playing. There is a, um, a private or social sector intervention provider. And then typically there's also some type of risk provider involved. So the social impact bonds, the 26 or so that have been done to date, have all been involved in a way that some foundation is largely covering much of the risk that that private sector source of capital is responsible for putting to place in the belief that the intervention provided will then be a cost saving such that the, the public sector will pay for it with some profit. Okay. All the questions about whether or not that model is appropriate or works, we, we can hold to the side. But in terms of healthcare, there are a lot of reasons to believe that it can be done and it probably should be considered. In fact, we should have these vehicles in place and understood so that we can respond more quickly in these types of emergencies. But we already see a lot of foundation money moving right now on this particular disease. Uh, just one example is Gates. While that money is incredible for its use right now, it could also be a very, very valuable leverage to attracting private capital. The idea of being a risk loss or being some type of, of uh, risk leverage for other private capital to follow should be what we talk about in terms of pay for success though the payer may not be obvious, in the end it's those foundations that keep coming up with money when no one else does. World Health Organization has to go out and find money when no one else does. There are payers. It's just very reactive, not proactive. And, and perhaps if we were smart, just like investing in, in, in infrastructure, we invest in the ability to be more responsive. Let me stop there so I don't get too far afield, but I'm Great, following. great. And, um, uh, Jeff, I'm going to let you say your last name since I know. Sure, one absolutely. My name is uh, Jeff Slagmelch. It's uh, spelled just how it sounds. And um, <laughs> you can ask this. Yes, yes. Um, so um, I'm the managing director for strategy and operations at the National Center for Disaster Preparedness with Dr. Redliner. Uh, my background is in public health. I uh, have my MPH in health policy and management, and also my MBA in, in business administration. Um, so uh, I, I think that a lot of really interesting points brought up here that really center around this concept of public-private partnerships. Uh, and I was doing some research a little while ago into public-private partnerships, and it was interesting that I, I found the best articulation of what that is actually from outside of where you might expect in the emergency management community, not that they aren't doing a great job. Um, I, I found an article in um, the International Journal of Supply Chain and Logistics Management. Thank God for search That's engines, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then, um, and also in public administration, really looking at kind of what is the business of response. And, and from these, uh, I think some really important insights were that, you know, government is often seen as the lead actor in disaster response, um, as it, you know, should be for a lot of reasons. Um, but that the actual operation of response is a conglomerate of uh, public resources, private resources, nonprofit entities. Um, and bringing these together in these partnerships, we have memorandums of understanding that um, might set the terms of a relationship, but the effectiveness of the relationship is really through more informal relationships and through trust being generated through planning together and practicing together and preparing together. Um, and also that, you know, where there's, there's a lot of emphasis on federal funding, um, and I think, uh, you know, it does a good job of creating a baseline level of preparedness, but it also can only go so far when you have an inherently political appropriations process. Um, there are going to be blind spots uh, to the interests of the private sector. 
um, and areas where the private sector is just better leveraged to be efficient. So I'll, I'll talk through just a couple of examples of uh, the current Ebola response that um, the private sector has been engaged with that I think are very interesting and maybe they'll provide some context for, for discussion. Uh, the first is we were talking about the, the pharmaceutical supplies. So a lot of the things you've heard about ZMAP, um, um, these other drugs were actually uh, developed under grants from the government to do small scale testing and development to kind of move things up in the pipeline at a way that was at, at low financial risk to the, to the research and development of it. Um, there's also been a lot of work done over the last 10 years to create emergency use authorization mechanisms um, to as essentially reduce the approval timeline of getting drugs to market. And although we haven't seen them in mass quantities being developed now, they are um, uh, under development and, and we're looking at a, a turnaround of uh, less than a year uh, on some of these, which is, is really unheard of uh, 10 years ago for that. And I think a, a large part of that is the relationship between the public and private sector in creating strategic investment, creating uh, subsidizing research and development for um, uh, drugs that may never be needed, uh, and allowing uh, companies to look at their chemical profiles um, and, and creating these databases to identify what might be effective so they can rapidly turn that into uh, a commercially viable product that also meets the regulatory requirements. Um, so part of it is investment, part of it is just uh, making it easier to do business and being more sensitive to uh, the, the, the risk calculations of the private sector. Um, another kind of more micro example, folks may have read about the Firestone Plantation in Liberia. Um, so here's an example of where um, actually the, the rubber plantation was really decimated from the civil war that, that had occurred there and is slowly being brought back. And so the threat of Ebola uh, was very, very felt in terms of the potential long-term, short-term and long-term impact on the financial viability of that plantation. Um, and so they had a health clinic and basically while the um, Senate in Liberia was arguing over whether or not Ebola was real or a ploy to get more, more foreign aid, um, they were ramping up with a war room. Um, they started, they converted pickup trucks into ambulances. They took their land surveyors and turned them into epidemiologists. And um, so they were actually able to prevent um, an outbreak among their staff and their families, even though in surrounding villages were being incredibly hard hit. Uh, that number was 80,000 people who were essentially removed from having to be under the care of, uh, of the government and essentially removed from the denominator. And then as they were able to stabilize, it started opening up services to people from outside those, uh, those immediate responders. Now with that comes a lot of controversy uh, as well too, such as where does a, a private sector company sort of draw its borders on where its concern begins and ends. Um, so you have a lot of arbitrary political borders, arbitrary po uh, corporate borders, and then diseases that know no borders. Um, but still, I think it's a very interesting kind of force multiplier for what uh, is trying to be achieved in the public's interest is also congruent. Um, and finally, there um, just in the last couple of months, there's been uh, some insurance policies being offered to organizations for non-physical damage disruption to revenue. And it's designed for healthcare organizations, among others, that have um, uh, if staff get quarantined or if a facility gets quarantined and essentially put out of business, it creates a uh, private sector mechanism for uh, covering the loss of revenue associated with that. Um, this concept is potentially a game changer uh, for the way we respond to infectious disease. Uh, along the same lines of the National Flood Insurance Program and earthquake insurance in California, it, it, um, uh, it takes a lot of the uncertainty out of conducting business during times of a pandemic. It also uh, alleviates the burden of the business either having to decide, you know, having to either go out of business or reduce uh, staff or rely on government support. So again, there's, um, there's a lot of activities that can be done in tandem with the public sector, but then there's also a lot of work that the private sector does every day that if we create mechanisms just to allow them to continue to do that, um, take some of the pressure off of the public sector for doing that and allows those resources to be, to be focused on areas that, that maybe don't have uh, a commercially viable application. Um, so uh, I'll just conclude by saying that, you know, the, I, I think a lot of times the, one of the challenges between the public and the private sector working together is that the way that value is articulated is done very differently. Um, but that being said, um, you can be altruistic and capitalistic and still sleep well at night. That so much of the objectives uh, overlap and, and so much of the operations are congruent with each other. And I think being able to really understand that um, and articulate that um, is an important step towards uh, building meaningful relationships. So. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, uh, Whitney, if you could uh, please introduce yourself and add in. 
Great. Good morning. Thank you for uh, inviting me. I'm Whitney Schneidman. I'm Senior International Advisor for Africa at Covington and Burling, which is a law firm in Washington, D.C. And I've been working in African issues for more than 30 years. Um, I've served twice in the State Department, worked in the World Bank, uh, but really spend a lot of my time thinking about economic development in Africa and how to leverage the private sector uh, in, in that process. So I think a lot of what I want to say, and I'll say it briefly, sort of dovetails nicely with, with what's been said, but let me just start with making one, um, one point about, about the response, what we've seen from other crises. When you look at the SARS epidemic, or the uh, tsunami in Asia, or the Haitian earthquake, or even uh, the HIV AIDS uh, pandemic uh, that really uh, hit its strength in, in the late 1990s. The first response is, is public sector money, no question about it. Uh, after, after SARS, after the tsunami, after the Haitian earthquake, we saw the, we saw the, the regional development banks, the Asian Development Bank, the Inter-American Deve Development Bank, the World uh, Bank, the IFC, come forward with different loans. And, and, and these loans were centered on getting business uh, back up and running um, in, in, in many respects. And we haven't quite seen that yet, but I think I think it's fair to uh, uh, expect it. It's certainly important to advocate for it because it's going to be an important source of uh, resources. Um, secondly, it's, I think it's really instructive to look at the response to the HIV AIDS uh, epidemic in uh, southern Africa because you had such a strong private sector response. Yes, the U.S. stepped up big time with about $50 billion and was instrumental in making any retrovirals available to about five to seven million people over the space of three or four years. But also huge corporations like Anglo American and SAB Miller and Ford Motor Company not only took care of their employees, but, but the employees' families, but in the communities. And, and, and to go to Jess' point, you know, the, the, there were no borders. You know, it was really an effort of, of the public and private sector uh, working uh, closely together. And I think that's, that's what we have coming, and that's what we need to, uh, again, advocate for as we go to figure out this, um, uh, a response to this crisis. My first uh, time in Liberia was in 2006, when uh, President Sirleaf came to the Clinton Global Initiative and uh, appealed for the U.S. private sector to help respond. And I started working with Bob Johnson, who had founded uh, uh, Black Entertainment Television, and he pledged $30 million to help uh, respond to what had been a 15-year civil war in which more than 200,000 people uh, were killed. So it's, it's a little bit like deja vu all over again, sort of um, 10 years later. Um, but again, you know, one of the things that we were able to do uh, as part of the response is that Mr. Johnson put up $3 million of his own money, and we're able to leverage $20 million from OPIC, the Overseas Private Insurance Corporation, that started making loans uh, in increments of $25,000 up to a million to Liberian businesses in an effort to help stimulate um, the local private sector. And I think that that kind of initiative was really quite important. Um, President Sirleaf asked Bob to, to build a hotel, and we built the first uh, four-star um, um, hotel in the country. So I think, I think this sort of gives an indication that it's just vital for the private sector and the public sector um, to come together um, as part of the response. Currently in, in Liberia, you've got something called the uh, Ebola, Ebola Private Sector Mobilization Group, of which Firestone's a member, but so are other companies such as Arcelor Metal, Rio Tinto, uh, companies from around the region. And, and, and there, there are calls every week. Um, among the members of this group, and all you have to do to, to get on the call is to send an email. And, and this group coordinates very closely with government and with the donors. And, you know, you've heard about the experience of Firestone and its 80,000 employees. You've, uh, Marcella Mertal has about 5,000 employees that it's now able to take their temperatures five times a day. So, you know, 
the infrastructure is emerging um, here and there. I think the challenge is how do you really spread that and how do you do that um, quickly? There's, there's another group that's come together. It's called the Africa Against Ebola Trust. And this includes companies like MTN and Econet and Coca-Cola. They're supporting the deployment of 1,000 health workers that are being mobilized by the African Union. Um, so I think, I think you know, where that leaves us is sort of, I think we're at the beginning of, of a surge of sorts in, in terms of responding. But, you know, that's overlaid in a country, again, like Liberia, which I know best, you know, the roads are impossible. The rainy season, it's, it's impossible to sort of get from Monrovia up to Gancha, which was one of the epicenters mm -hmm. of the Ebola crisis. And so it really comes down to infrastructure, not just health infrastructure, but roads infrastructure, education. And I think you know, we really have to see this as a holistic response. We have a very near-term and immediate medical emergency, but to really address this fully, it, it has to be an economic development response. And that means you know, there, there are many parts to that. So that's sort of how I come at this my lens on this crisis and, and, and helping to mobilize business, helping to, you know, the businesses that are there are doing a good job. You know, how can you uh, use, use what they're doing and leverage those resources? How can you leverage other resources? And I think that's, that's really the, the, the challenge, whether it's social impact investing, whether it's, you know, private sector investing. I guess one last point is wh what I've been most impressed by in my travels around Africa, looking at the health sector, is really looking at the private sector response. You know, there's been such, such growth in Africa over the last 10 to 15 years, and there's been this, this large middle class that's emerged, and that has spawned this whole network of private clinics, and they do a really good job of making services available. So, so something tells me that that's definitely worth investing in. It can be sustainable, and it can play a very important role in uh, making sure that there's an, not, not only that an adequate health infrastructure emerges, but it's sustainable and grows uh, over time. Thank you, Wendy. I think Les is here. Les, are you, uh, do I see you in the back? So the timing is perfect. Uh, the, the train has finally delivered uh, our moderator. <laughs> and uh, it couldn't be more appropriate to answer some of these questions, some direct questions, since Brett, uh, Les actually wrote the book on investing in healthcare. So, Les, if you could please come up and join us and uh, introduce yourself briefly and then lead us through a series of questions. We're, we'll stay an extra five minutes or so for, uh, five or 10 minutes or so for Q&A from the audience too, since we're a little bit delayed. Uh, great, thank you very much. And apologies for uh, geographical issues, um, which in New York shouldn't be a, as big a problem as it is in Liberia, but I made it into that. Um, Good morning, I'm Les Funtleiter. Uh As Todd said, I wrote the book, Healthcare Investing. Uh, my um, association with Africa is that uh, I'm a consult consulting partner for Blue Cloud Healthcare, which is actually uh, an incubator that uh, helps get investing into private African healthcare companies. So it's very uh, a great segue for me. Uh, my day job is actually as a uh, hedge fund manager for E-Squared Asset Management, and I've been uh, a professional investor for over 20 years. Um, you know, uh, uh, as in order to spur conversation, I, I wanted to, you know, talk about my, quote unquote, talking my book. And um, how, uh, and this for the panel, so you've got um, essentially mercenary capitalists like me floating around with lots of money. Uh, not me personally, but just in the <laughs> grand scheme of things. We know that there's a ton of demand in Africa, uh, both because of the economic development and, and most specifically because of uh, the, we'll say, the current emerging infectious disease, which is Ebola, but we know there are others coming. How can we, how can the private sector, if you're you know, advising a fund, how can we make money? And um, bar bearing in mind that we're not averse to actually having a social impact too. Uh, so uh, I'll open up to the, uh, the entire panel. 
Do yeah, I'll just uh, let, let me take a first cut at that. I mean, it's it's actually quite interesting. What what we've seen is um, a number of companies, healthcare companies from India, setting up private networks in East Africa, and I think there's clearly an emerging model of providing quality, low cost healthcare on a commercial basis in major metropolitan areas in Africa, secondary metropolitan areas, and tertiary metropolitan areas. And it's really a question of finding, frankly, the right people to do that and to go implement the, uh, the model. There's no question, from my mind, that the model is sound and it's needed because what happens if, if, if you set up a network of clinics be it Nairobi, be it Monrovia, be it Sierra Leone, number one, you're going to be providing health care, but you're also going to be training people to provide that health care. And over a three to five year, seven year period, those people that you're training, they're going to go start other health clinics. And that's how you're going to develop the capacity. So you may call yourself a mercenary capitalist. Um, I see you as more as a very desired soul. The, the problem in, in, in Africa is not so much the capital. There's a lot of capital that's looking to invest. It's really finding the people to invest in. And, and, and Africa is really about investing in Africans and, and getting the right people together, understanding the environment, working with the government, um, dealing with the logistics and the infrastructure issues so that you can put that capital to good use and it can generate the returns that will sustain the investment. I would just add as well too that the um, um, along that point that there's a lot of investment in, in Africa right now and a lot of it's in a variety of areas from manufacturing to uh, um, uh, finances to banking to, to cellular phone networks and uh, like anywhere else in the world you know a, a workforce that's well taken care of is, is kind of prerequisite to to having the intellectual capital uh, at whatever company it is and so having uh, an effective healthcare system um, having hospitals that function, having places where people can seek care, um, again, is one of these crossover areas where it's in the interest of the government, it's in the interest of the people, it's also in the interests of free-flowing economic activity and, and in the interest of having a quality workforce that is able to focus on working instead of, uh, instead of health. Um, I mentioned as we were talking before the panel, uh, I did my practicum in a, a second-tier city in Tema, Ghana, um, which is right outside the capital of Accra, and it's a major port city, and I um, spent my time at a private hospital there and uh, spent part of my time in the reception area. And all of the different companies that had set up in this port city um, had some degree of insurance for their staff. There was a, a Coca-Cola bottling plant and they would have the cards with the pictures of their beneficiaries on them. Um, there were some fishing companies that had uh, letters on letterhead so someone would go to occupational health and then get referred there and then have coverage for that. So having these kinds of resources available, um, y you have a, a customer base that is also uh, not only um, in Africa but that's also investing in Africa and it, it kind of creates this, this snowball effect of of a, um, and it has the, the byproduct of doing some good for um, the overall health of the community and uh, um, improving the business environment beyond uh, this, the specific investment. Well, and I also thought you uh, teed up the question perfectly right at the end uh, by saying, hey, you know, how can we make money in Africa? And by the way, we're not opposed to a social impact too. That is the question of social impact in general. It, and it's no offense to what you do, and why should it be? Money does what money does. Social impact as a concept has been around for quite some time. The term social impact itself is relatively new, or impact investing. But to think that money does anything other than what money does, which is return at its highest available rate, is slowing down the understanding of how we can allocate private capital into public outcomes effectively and efficiently. To think that someone will say, well, maybe I'll accept just a little less this time because I really care about what we're after is only good for a fairly small segment of sources of capital, family office, some foundations being the leaders of that. We've watched this experience over the last decade, especially within our alliance, which are the sources of capital for these types of funds investing in communities, trying to create jobs and build capacity. To think that, that um, we can say, all right, there is some way for us to attract private capital now to this scale of a problem, 
and understand that they may have to take some kind of cutback because they're doing social good is just a non-starter. I'm sure you could be the first to express why that's the case. You have your fiduciary responsibilities. What we do have, however, is an opportunity to understand the relationship that if at one end is return and at another end of this continuum is social impact, trying to believe we can live and pull back and forth in that continuum is actually holding us back from getting more done, especially in, in a scale of crisis as large as this. As Whitney expressed, the real core, the, the ground solution here is around economic development. These countries most at risk, most you know, uh, being affected, are those with the least amount of grassroots capacity to do the basics of trying to, to limit these problems. So I would suggest that let's think less about how you can make money in Africa and more understand how can private capital be allocated and be incented by public sector outcomes in a way that lets you do what you do. Every time we ask you to say, hey, this is a socially good thing, you should consider it, we know generally the outcome is, thanks, it's just not really what we do. So the idea that there's a public sector partner here in the middle of your private capital and these outcomes on the other end, this public-private partnership, is really where we can spend a lot of time talking. And I think there's already a lot that's been done over the last decade and more to understand that if there is some foundation or public sector that is willing to say, I understand what we're trying to achieve and we can't get it done through our, our typical legislative process of, of pulling down capital from a very limited government budget, we have a great opportunity to say, well, we could be first loss or we could create a, a social impact bond because the private capital will say, I'm going after this amount of return based on this amount of risk. The way social impact has been run so far has largely been limited because it says we are going to go after these very difficult uh, challenges and, and try to compete with what is really private equity returns and also get the social impact. Well, not only have we set them up for failure on a return perspective, because those are tough challenges in the first place, but we've also immediately limited the amount of capital that could come to these types of solutions. So if there is some type of first loss provider, albeit you know, be it foundations or some type of uh, public sector payer on the back end, let's say you covered the first 20 or 30% of risk, now the capital, the private capital looking at these challenges can say, all right, the probability that this fund or this, this vehicle, whatever it may be, would lose more than, let's say, 30% of its principal is low enough that I'm really only looking at a 5 to 7, 8% return, let's say. Uh, then the idea would be that it's not just the capital from their alternative investments portfolio that's relevant. It might be from their fixed income, which, which is getting similar returns if they're doing well. Now we've changed the paradigm of how private sector engages. If we don't understand the vehicles that the public sector can employ, and their willingness to take those positions on an economic impact analysis type of view, I think we'll consistently be talking but not doing in this, in this environment. Now, uh, that's a, an excellent uh, point uh, for, uh, so, uh, very pragmatic, by the way, from a uh, return perspective, because we care about returns. But can you, or anybody, uh, either um, describe the mechanics of how this might work, or maybe there are some case studies that we can point to that, uh, the, for when the non-Bill Gateses of the world go and invest, how, how can they succeed? And are there policy considerations that uh, either from some global UN kind of thing or US or Africa that could encourage this? So would anybody? Well, I, I think in terms of, of policy implications, I'd look to some of the uh, uh, opening up to the private sector that happened in India in the early early 90s that really made investment uh, a more viable option for things. You know, and I'm, I'm kind of running through my head, you know, again, this uh, how do you explain things to the public health person in me and how do you explain things to the MBA in me and the, um, you know, so uh, on kind of a micro level, you know, one of, the, one of the big challenges with combating disaster is your baseline infrastructure. If you have very, very low uh, or high, not a lot of doctors and a lot of people. Is that a high ratio, low ratio? Anyway, um, the, um, uh, what you need are more doctors, right? Uh, so from the public health perspective, from the public policy perspective, it's one of the things that are going to bring in more doctors. But on the private sector, if you have trouble retaining staff because you don't have a functioning healthcare infrastructure, it's the same solution. It's more, more physicians, it's more clinicians, more nurses, more ancillary staff. Um, so there, there's a, a business case to be made. It's maybe articulated differently than in that, but then that also has to be done in a policy environment where um, uh, that's favorable to the private sector. That um, 
Um, and I, I probably can't speak too intelligently to what those challenges are uh, specifically in Africa, but, um, but obviously um, if there isn't a profit to be made or if there's a lot of risk to being able to either repatriate profits or keep it uh, circulating within the business, um, then that's going to be a disincentive that's factored into that, that um, uh, risk calculation. You know, I'd just say if, um, from a policy sector uh, perspective, um, virtually every country in Africa has what's known as a Vision 2020 or 2030, where they put forward what their policy objectives are over a number of areas, and health is very, very central to this. So it's, it's essential that, that any capital coming in is aligned with the country's national development objectives. Because that then gives you the basis to engage the government on a policy dialogue, which is going to be extremely important. Uh, that's number one. Number two is who's going to be your local partner? How do you find your local partner? Because it's, it's not going to work just to bring you know, health workers from the US or the UK or some external environment and, and, and put them in. But, but partnerships are really what's going to drive this uh, dynamic forward. And I think in the health care sector, uh, I'm sure whether it's Liberia or Uganda, you know, there, as I mentioned earlier, there, 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 there are clinics that are up and running and that there are individuals in those clinics that uh, would be, number one, very receptive to an outside partner coming in, but would be very welcoming of, of capital to help expand the operation uh, on a commercial basis. And I think this capital can be um, repatriated and um, do what capital does, be, be returned uh, uh, to its investors. Um, but it requires research. It requires on the ground getting to know the, you know, the local folks, the local environment, the policy environment, the uh, capacity environment, and then structuring your investment um, accordingly. But that's what's, that's what's interesting about Africa today is that it's happening in sector after sector, country after country, over and over again. I want to thank everybody who was involved and who came and participated in this. And uh, I wanted to use this opportunity to highlight and thank uh, Louise Rosen and Emily Morris and the Columbia Alumni Association um, for pulling this together and making this possible. Uh, this started with a small business school club idea, expanded into a large university uh, concept, and I think we're going to deliver out some pretty amazing uh, findings and suggestions that can really have an impact on this. So thank you to the CAA because it, uh, it's uh, perhaps the only organization that can reach across different programs and help generate uh, idea sharing um, like that here. So, um, and thank you for all coming.